Conservation District Reef Outreach Meeting. The district is pleased to introduce Joel Semke, the Reef Coordinator from the State Conservation Commission. We also welcome Amy Walker of the Farm Service Agency to go over some programs and deadlines. We want to thank you all for your attendance tonight and your passion for your profession. Um, real quick sign note, this meeting is being recorded just so that others can learn from it too. And now we're this meeting with the all right, hey, good evening, everybody. Good evening, Tom Ress. Sorry. No, no worries. Uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for the opportunity to talk. It's always good to get out of the office, uh, but especially good to get out here. I don't often get out this way. It's been, you know, six years of practice since I was last here. You know, every day I ride, I ride my bike across the Susquehanna River to get to work. And then, uh, you know, I can walk pretty much across the whole river. <laughs> this is it's very impressive. Uh, anyway, okay, so I'm, I'm uh, Joel Semke, I'm the Reef Coordinator. I've been the Reef Coordinator since um, 2013, roughly, with the State Conservation Commission. Um, yeah, so I'll, tonight I think we'll, we'll just uh, want to go through the program and just summarize it. I know a lot of you probably have used it, uh, know a lot of people have used it. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of that will be reviewed, but it, you know, every time I go through this, it's always good to just share your thoughts and folks' mind that you thought you, know, you may have forgotten about how to use the program. So we'll talk about that, number one, about the, how the program functions and how it might fit your operation. Number two, I want to take a little more time uh, talking about uh, how REAP interacts with all the other programs and all the other funding that's coming away, uh, whether that's you know, a slew of acronyms, sorry, uh, when you put money from NRCS or, or the newer pot of ACAP funds or I don't know, shell money or wherever. You know, funds that are coming into the, the county that hopefully you all can access to, to improve things on the farm. And thirdly, I want to talk about just um, you know, how, how to most efficiently go about using those uh, re, the, the REAP funding, which is the, state, the form of state income tax credit. So we, we want to talk about how to use that and some, some newer opportunities and some focus of the State Conservation Commission and the REAP program about how to help you all access those funds. So uh, just for some, you know, housekeeping. If you have some questions, uh, please just jump in, raise your hand, or if you're, you know, the other site there, just let me know. I'll, I'll try to pause as much as I can for questions. Uh, that's the best thing, you know. Not leaving lots of time for here for questions. Uh, and then also, I apologize in advance. I tend to like lapse into speaking in acronyms. So, <laughs> you know, every once in a while, I'll just say a whole sentence of acronyms, and I'll have to be reminded. We'll come back to this point and explain that stuff. So, okay. Uh, anyway, anyway. Switch to the next one there. All right. So, yeah. Number one, let's do this here. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, Reef. Again, just to refresh your memory, Reef is. Uh, it's now a $13 million uh, annual funded pro uh, program. It's first come, first serve, uh, based on, on Clean Streams Law, you know, compliance with Clean Streams Law, PA Clean Streams Law. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's basically uh, what you think of traditional ag needs, from anything from waste storage facilities, uh, erosion issues out in the field. And then what's unique to reap is equipment credits. You know, funding for no-till equipment, uh, upgrades to your to your precision nutrient placement capabilities, cover crop equipment, that sort of stuff is is unique to reap. Um, funding levels you know vary between 50 percent and up to 90 percent depending on the, the, what practice you put in, where you are if you're in, in a special watershed. Um, you know the credits it's in the funding to you is in the form of Pennsylvania State income tax credits. We'll talk more about that as we go on in some detail here. And there is a $250,000 uh, credit in, in a seven-year period for an operation. Uh, so kind of keep it going. Okay, so first thing I want to highlight here, um, the way REAP works, first come, first serve, we start, we start with a pot of $13 million and we start taking applications first Monday of, of any given August. And we go until that funding is exhausted. So, you know, there's no deadlines for uh, application to be sent in up front, but you know, we run out of money, and lately that's been pretty fast. So this past year we ran out uh, right around October 1st, so that's you know, 
three months at the most. And I think this year is probably going to be the same. In the past, this lasted longer, so I think we'll, we'll see if we go back to that. But uh, proposed projects and completed projects. That's very important part of brief. You can apply up ahead, you know, ahead of putting something in or buying a piece of equipment based on the cost of it. Whether that estimate comes from NFCS or the district or whether that comes from you know, a price quote from a contractor or, or equipment dealer. Or you can wait until after the project time. You really have three years after something is done to still get new credit. So you could, you know, if you just got a planter, let's say, uh, delivered this, this past spring, you can apply for it now, you can apply for it the next spring uh, if you don't get it this time. But you got a window there to, to make sure you're getting your funding. Uh, either way works. For proposed projects, what we do is we reserve those credits and they get awarded to you officially when the project's done, when that plan to is delivered to you upon that kind of stuff. Um, okay, 75% credits. This is stuff that the state sort of views as high priority practices. You know, your, your nutrient management plans, your, your ag plans, plans, uh, anything with, with what we say ACA, animal concentration area, uh, and anything you know, inside that stream pool. Those are the high priority practices of the state. Those are 75% reimbursement. 50%, you know, anything equipment related, uh, and then more storage systems, cover cropping, other things like that are 50% back to you. Uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, oh, and, and what's new here since 2019, um, Reef has offered some credits for 90% um, reimbursement to you. That's in a high priority watershed, I guess, you know, the correct terminology for that is a TMDL watershed. There are plenty of them uh, all over the state. The biggest one is the Chesapeake Bay watershed. That whole section of the state is a TMDL watershed. But out here in the county, there are many. And, it, and to clarify, that's an ag uh, impaired uh, TMDL. I don't know, Jeff, do you know if you guys have ag TMDL written in your county? Not really. Okay. Yeah, I figured most of your stuff, being, being that you have a mix of urban, it's probably, you know, the TMDLs, sorry, ball from a rabbit trail. There's plenty of written for you know, fish consumption, industrial pollution, that kind of stuff, all, all kinds of things. If there's a TMDL for you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment deposition, that's what makes it all So, uh, big one here. We'll talk some more about this, but NRCS projects, EQIP projects, ACAP projects, um, you know, if you're getting money from, from Shell for their funding. That kind of money, those kind of projects uh, receiving that money, they're also eligible for REAP. What we do is we take that total cost and we subtract that other funding. What's left then is what you get your REAP credit back based on. So that's very helpful. It's a big use of, of REAP lately, especially if, as costs have gone up and, and the NRCS funding has maybe not kept up with that. Um, that gap has gotten bigger. And, and you know, it always was a big project to be, you know, $30,000. I know you guys are doing a lot bigger gaps than that. Uh, REAP can really help to offset that, especially when you couple that with some of the options we're going to talk down with, uh, you know, a little bit later on with the sponsorship and some of these other options for you. But that's a problem, that's really an attractive piece of REAP. No matter where you are, you know, who you're working with, REAP works with that. Uh, you know, I often tell farmers to view us as kind of like the last stop. You can fund a project entirely with REAP, but you also can go get NRCS first, then come to REAP. You can get ACAP first, then come to REAP to really touch off or top off that, that last bit of hot, hot, true out of pocket cost. Uh, yeah. Actually, let's we'll pause that. Is there any other questions? Any, any questions that I said that sparked something to you or at the other side here? All right. Uh, yeah, again, I would, that's all right, yeah, I did uh, yeah, sorry. Okay, so what we'll costs are eligible? I mean, I just want to highlight there, you know, stuff that is pretty self-explanatory here, except for this one, this labor that you do yourself. If you're out there having staples in a grass waterway, you're rolling out, you know, the, the netting, or even if you're running a skid loader, you know, love and stone in a farm or something. Keep track of that time. Make me a bill. I mean, I, I work off of the, the um, just for reference, I use that PA custom guide. 
which hasn't really been updated for a while, but I, you know, I just base it off of the bills that I see from contractors and others. Make me a bill for your time. Give me as much detail as you can, but that's eligible for, for the cost here. Uh, and, then, and then again, just highlight that. Other public funding, you have to account for it uh, somewhere. The rate law says you, know, you can't be double dipping, so we've got to account for it, but you're eligible there using other, other funding sources. So, so what labor rate can farmers use? Can they use for down the No. Uh, to clear, yeah, so, sorry. Uh, if, if you didn't hear in the back there, he asked about the minimum wage. Uh, now there are other funding sources that require prevailing wage to be calculated. Reap, um, and forgive me for getting into the weeds of this stuff. Uh, I sometimes barely understand myself. But prevailing wage, a farmer cannot charge prevailing wage for their own work. That's the short story of it. Um, the longer story is that REAP is not viewed as a grant program because we're not writing anybody a check and therefore REAP is not under the same requirement that you or contractors get paid for minimum wage. However, if your contractor is working through ACAP or growing greener or, or whatever else and they are sending you bills that have prevailing wage, we'll cover it. That, that's, that's fine, but if you yourself are running a ski loader out there, you can't charge me for bailing wage. And I, sorry to make it personal, it's not like you're charging me for bailing wage, but that's, you know, all those bills come to my desk, and yeah, for bailing wage, when they're way up over top of market rate, that goes to cut down to more by the normal. Well, well, what I see is averages across the state. So, did that answer your question? Okay. Uh, but, Okay, so I mentioned REAP is first come for serve. Uh, you know, we start in August and we go until the funding is, uh, is exhausted. But how, how we determine what you know the eligibility requirements of it are to boil it down is compliance with Clean Streams Law. That's you know the ag parts of that. So for you, for farmers, that means uh, current plans, up to date plans, ag plans. plans. Uh, sometimes conservation plans are, are it's sort of it's, you know, the same terminology. Ag ES plans are the by law. I mean, that's conservation plan has to meet those standards of the Ag ES plans. Uh, on all your acres, so it's not just the site where the project is happening, all your acres. If you have a thousand acres and you're picking up 50 here and there and dropping 50, please call. Them. We can work through that. Uh, but, you know, start off with that. We want to see plans on all the acres, rented, home, everything. Uh, and then the oil plants, same way. If you're, if you're a CAO, you've got to have that Act 38 nutrient management plan, same with CAFOs. If you're, a, if you're another farmer not covered by those laws, you've got to have, but you have animals or import an R, you've got to have a norm Again, up to date, on track for implementation of that plan. And then the third step there with REAP is this last one. ACA related practices, they have to be fully implemented too. These other, these other ones, uh, if you're on track, I mean, if you've got a grass waterway, let's say, out in field 10, scheduled for the spring of 2024, great, you're in compliance with Queen Street Law, that's scheduled, you're on, you're on schedule for full implementation of the plan. However, if that would be a, an ACA, an animal concentration related problem, barnyard, let's say, scheduled for spring of 2024, you've got to have that fully implemented before you can get Greek credits for a no-till plan or cover crops or something like that. That ACA problem has to be fixed before you can get credit, excuse me, credits for anything else. Uh, you can apply for all this stuff all at once. I'll reserve credits for you. Nothing's going to get officially awarded to you until that ACA issue is fixed. So, okay. Okay, what's new for REAP? Um, you know, every year we, we alter the firm, we clarify things, we change things, we add things, subtract things. Uh, recently, you know, I'll just talk about what stuff has been added since, since 2019, maybe that was the PA. The PA farm bill, we got a little bit more funding, and with it, we were able to update some, some things that to offer that 90% tax credit. Uh, this year, we're, gonna, we're, we're shifting the focus more toward multi-species cover crops. Certain single-species cover crops are still eligible for 50% back to you. Uh, I'll talk some more about that in, in a little bit, but uh, we're focusing more on that cover crop. So the, you know, the cutoffs for costs are higher for multi-species multi cover crops. 
Uh, if you're in in rig for a while, consistently get single species to continue being eligible for cover crops, you've got to bump up to a multi-species. That's something very interesting. Uh, precision prescriptions. That's I, I lack a good term for that. I don't know if you all you probably have better terminology for that than I do, but that's basically the, the data and inputs you need to plug it into your computer and your tractor and drive across the field and your your sprayer, you know, your nitrogen and phosphorus are shutting off or adjusting as you drive on that. That kind of prescription. That stuff is eligible. I mean that includes having a consultant out there doing uh, grid grid sampling. Uh, that includes, obviously, it always has included the equipment to enable you to do that. Now we're talking about the data inputs that enable you to do that. Um, and and that, that includes a, a, a long list of things, whether it's a whole you know, plan that a consultant is writing for you, that soil sampling that you need, that yield data, that stuff, that, that inputs are, are eligible for cover crop. Or excuse me, tax credits. Cover crop drones, uh, you know, I got a ton of questions about this this past year. We're going to try it, see what happens. I get plenty of conflicting you know, advice about whether that actually works or whether that's feasible long term. We're going to try it. You know, cap the, you know, you can get a $10,000 maximum tax credit for buying a cover crop drone and trying it. Um, I don't know how long we'll keep doing that, but that's new for this year. Um, Sill pasture, uh, I don't know if you, you get into that much here. You can, yeah, I mean, that's that hit or miss across the state. Most, you know, certain counties get to do that more than others. But, uh, and then, and then upgrade kits. This is something sort of new. Uh, taking an old planter in and getting all new row units on it, precision upgrades. Uh, as long as that precision upgrade includes some nitrogen and phosphorus placement capabilities, that's available to you. Rather than you having to go buy a brand new planter, uh, you can take your old from the new And I think John Deere, as long as it's a, uh, I think it's in 1775. Uh, you, you all know better than that, but that's, that's available uh, moving forward now for you too. Right. Okay, so uh, again, I'll pause. Any questions? All right. Um, using tax credits. I mean, it's, it's not, a, not a tool that you normally use or not a, a funding system that you're probably used to. However, every year, uh, you know, 320 to 350 farmers use REAP. Plenty of them have done many times over. So it is a system that, that, that works and provides some flexibility. That, that's maybe a, a nicer way of putting the complicated issues with it. It, it. it gives you flexibility. It gives you 15 years to use them from the date of issuance. Draw on like a debit card, dollar for dollar, to, to pay that, that PA income tax bill. That's on a joint return. All the income on a joint return is especially useful if you have off the farm income. If you have uh, a job that has withholding, or if you have a, like a gas lease or something like that, where you're getting that kind of income coming in, the credit can be used against all that income. It doesn't have to be just farm income. That's on like an LL, you know, if you have a pass through entity, um, you pass through the credits just like you do in the crown uh, uh, membership state. Uh, if it's to your social security, it's you and, and anybody on that joint return, uh, you use the credits for it. Uh, and then, yeah, dollar for dollar. It's, it, just to make that just clarification, it's not a deduction, it's a, it's a credit. So it's against all your liability, your PA income liability. Um, okay, so I mentioned that about pastures and, and joint claiming them. Uh, you also have the option to transfer them to, to family members after a year. So somebody that's maybe not in, in a pass through, like an S Corp or an LLC, it's an unofficial member, you can use this process to, to send your credits to them every year if you want to. Uh, call me for more information about it. There's, there's certainly Department of Revenue has a little more guidelines about it, but that's, that's a good use to have plenty of farmers that do that every year. They pass it out to their kids, grandkids, uh, other people who are involved in the operation uh, that maybe aren't on that official business end of the business. All right, so sale transfer. Um, yeah, this is, this is getting into how to maybe more efficiently use this stuff. Uh, plenty, plenty of farmers, you know, you're just not set up your year to use, to, to use tax credit because you're not showing income. Um, this is a way, 
you know, the Department of Revenue requires you to wait one calendar year. They want to make sure that you don't owe them anything or owe some form from back in 2017 for an employee that worked for you for two weeks. They want to make sure that, that you've got to keep this thing for a year before you can sell it. But selling it uh, enables you to turn a, a $50,000 tax credit into a check for $45,000 or so. I mean, those are hypothetical figures, but that's how a sales trade sort of process works. Plenty of business entities out there are, are looking for tax credits. Banks are the biggest buyers in these things. Um, they'll pay you at a discount rate, gives you about 90 cents a dollar. They'll pay you for your tax credit. So you have to wait a year, and you have to use it once if you've got any bill to pay. Um, that first year of this issue, and then you can sell the rest of it. That's it. About 35 to 40 percent of green uh, farmers who, you know, who get tax credits, they end up selling a year or more out. Some of you don't have to sell it one year out. You can wait till, you know, you can wait till seven or eight years out and decide you know, you're not using it and sell it. Uh, you can transfer bits of it. You can sell parts of it at a time. Uh, you have that. You have plenty of flexibility there. But when I when I see Farmers, they're um, when they have unexpected sales of land or things like that down the road, they're they're often thankful that they kept a little bit back. So anytime I can talk to a farmer up front and say, hey, well, you know, sell sell most of it, but keep keep some of the back for unexpected uh, hits of income that you want you want to plan on. Well, now you've got a tax credit to cover that. Not really the same. You can sell them to any business or individual. Um, I mentioned this about banks being the biggest buyer. Please talk to your bank directly. I mean, there are there are brokers out there that will help you sell these things. They will charge you commission. I certainly they're they're great to get the job done. They're not related to the state at all. Uh, I had a list of the folks that I'm familiar with that work with plenty of farmers, but don't use them if you don't have to. Talk to your bank. I mean, your banks banks are the biggest buyers of these things. Uh, you know, have them call me if they don't understand the system. That's what I find the most. Is a bank that, if a, a bank says, sorry, farmer, I don't, you know, I'm not interested. It's usually because they don't understand the system. And as soon as I get a chance to talk to the farmer, or the bank, excuse me, they'll work with you. They, they, they're looking for ways to keep your business. And this is a great way to work with you. Um, okay. Uh, or any business. I, don't, I shouldn't, it's not just banks that are buying these things. I mean, they're driving around the, County here, there are plenty of big business entities. If they have are operating in PA, they are liable to pay PA income tax and they can buy your tax credit from you. If you guys have neighbors, you have you know, you, you have people that work for those companies, talk to them. It's a good good way to connect the dots here with your local local community, the local live community. Um, but again, thanks to this, that's the first thing. Have you seen like banks or businesses, whatever, like have a minimum they want to buy or a maximum? Like, is there is there a sweet spot to get people to right. buy uh, from you? I've not seen that. There's a, um, I guess just anecdotally, there's a uh, there's a broker. They they this broker deals with just big tax credits. So there are there are big companies out there. You know, uh, you know we're all familiar with Zoom since the last three. This world, but Zoom Media, I mean, they bought great tax credits for farmers, but they're looking for big, big pots. Um, REI, they buy tax credits from, from folks, uh, you know, it, it runs the game. But uh, no, I mean, the longer answer to your question is no. I mean, there, there's uh, small banks, Northern Tier uh, has a lot of banks that uh, just work directly with the farmers, they'll buy, they'll buy a couple thousand dollars here or there. They're, Consider good business practice and look good. Uh, the bigger ones, you know, if you have a big tax credit, you'll, you'll get a call from somebody asking to sell it to from the big company. But no, I mean, if you have small ones, your banks will work with you. I mean, out here, I guess out this way, uh, Mercer County State Bank's probably the most, that's the one that sticks off the top of my head. They're in the work with you a bit. But they work with small, obviously, it's a small bank. Um, Find small banks in Central PA and Northern Tier that work for a little farm. So I've found that banks are easy. They'll they'll buy from anybody. Any any amount, they'll do it. 
bigger businesses, like they want the big costs. You know, it's just easier to function than $100,000 or so. Uh, anyway, uh, any other questions on that? Uh, okay, so so I mentioned this already. Individual sale, that's where you, you do a little bit of legwork and you farm a buyer. Uh, certainly, I advise you to do that. Please give me a call. I can you know, go through my list of who's come through the system, try to give you like, a, a little bit of direction. Before, before it, but, but the sky's the limit. I mean, that anybody, anybody with PA liability, any corporation or a bank can provide these things. Brokers, I mentioned that. It's an application that comes back to me um, for the buyer. They want to have this thing back from you by December 31st of the given year. And that goes for transfer. If you're transferring a little bit of credit to your, to your kids, that has to be back to you by December 31st of so the given tax year. Um, Department of Revenue, you know, that, that's cut off eight for business. So you, you do have to back up your tax plan a little bit. But call me about that. If you, if you have any uh, plans on doing that or, or desires to do that, you know, call me about later. Um, yeah, that, okay. Income from tax credits is reportable, as opposed to the credit itself. If you have a tax credit from the state, that is not, it's not reportable income at any level. As soon as you sell it, it is. So, you know, I mentioned selling to your bank for a dollar. You sort of have to think there, okay, I'm going to have reportable income for that amount. And not go. So that's, again, that gets back to that. I always advise you to save a little bit of chunk back for yourself to, to pay your bigger taxes. And you, know, you, can you. Uh, you can sell anytime, multiple times in there. You know, if you start with $100,000, you can sell chunks anytime for, for you know, small bits and um, Is that also federal and local reporting or just state? Yeah, that's, that's reportable income at all levels. Even though it's a state tax credit, as soon as you sell it, that's, that's reportable. Consider it selling hay or whatever. It's just the same thing. All right, so this, I'm going to spend some time on this. This is a, uh, me personally, this has been my goal with the, since I started in 2013, uh, to really raise the farmers' use of this option. Um, you know, back when I started, sponsorship has always been in the REAP program, and I haven't mentioned it, REAP's been around since 2007. Uh, you know, it was created kind of as a way to incentivize getting those ag and plans and, and also reward farmers for doing so. But anyway, um, it was, sponsorship's always been a part of the program. It's very rarely used. Uh, people just didn't know about it. It was, it was maybe a little bit more complicated than what it would be. You know, I work with stuff every day. I don't think it's all that complicated. But sponsorship is a way for you, the farmer, never see the REAP tax credit. The REAP tax credit goes directly to a bank or third-party business or, or whoever. Uh, and that business then, that bank then, writes you a check or pays you by locking off principal of the loan. You know, whether that's a business, business loan or a project loan. Um, it's a great way to, again, you know, foster those, those relationships with the local businesses, the local banks work together and try to get more efficient funding out of this group. Um, the, the farmer, you know, the, re, the bulk of the application is still the farmer's responsibility. You're still responsible to be in compliance with the industry involved. The project still has to be eligible for tax credits, but the applicant is, you know, Shell or it's Bank, Northwest Bank, whoever, whatever banks are big around here. Uh, that's the applicant. Once your project is done, you you know you the farmer go about your normal business, send you the receipts and the completion stuff. At that point, the tax credit is awarded to the bank or business, and they then pay you usually ninety cents in the dollar. So you still take that. You're still not getting the full value of the credit, but you save yourself a year. You're getting some more, uh, maybe more uh, immediate funding. From the program. If your long-term goal is to sell it anyway. This is a great option uh, to get involved, you know, get a business involved on the front, front end of things, get your bank involved on the front end of things. Uh, again, banks are usually where I see it. You know, the, it's a big project. You have a barnyard, waste storage facility, something like that. If you've got a project loan with your bank already, likely, you know, even if you're working with NRCS or, or ACAP or something like that, it's 
likely that you've got a project loan. That bank that holds that project loan, it's a great opportunity for them to use re tax credits that you earn from this project to pay off a big chunk of your principal. So again, we're talking about lowering that gap. When you take a chunk from equip, a chunk from, I don't know where, that last bid goes right to the bank. You know, you, the farmer, can walk out of this, you know, what seemed like a very daunting project at the start with a, a pretty manageable little money. So that's what we want to use it for the most. Uh, those, those big projects, those, uh, those loans that you're getting now, and, and there's another slide here later for, for another program that may help you with those loans. But it's a great opportunity. You're working with your bank all the time. Uh, you know, it's a great, great way to get them involved in the front part of the program rather than buying things from the after effect. Uh, we're up to about 65 sponsors in a year. Uh, Sheets is the biggest sponsor of farmers around the state. And they, you, know, you all don't need another excuse to go see Sheets. But, they buy a lot, they buy like two million dollars of credits from, from farmers. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, not buy, but sponsor farmers. The farmers run in the sponsors. Um, all around the state, they're, they're working with farmers on them to, to sponsor their projects. Uh, Fulton Bank is usually the biggest buyer of credits after the fact. But Sheets, Sheets is a great uh, whole family, you know, the Sheets Incorporated, or some of the individual members uh, are working to buy, you know, to, to Sponsor projects on farmers, whether it's equipment, cover crops, all kinds of stuff. Uh, same way, yeah, no, those small credits, big credits, what have you, they, they love working with farmers. So it's a good, it's a good connection. Again, it doesn't have to be a big entity like that. It doesn't have to be a bank like Fulton. It could be, could be your, your neighbor that has a big um, Yeah, you want to. Okay, this is, this is a quick example of one. This is one of the first sponsorship projects that I worked with um, back in 2017 when we were really starting to get, when I was starting to really like promote sponsorship, get it moving in. This farmer, in this case, he had um, worked with Equip. He, he was a big dairy, put in a digester uh, and some other improvements around the, the barn. Um, and he even field work, stuff like that. Uh, uh, he applied to REAP on his own, and, and at that point, you know, what he was asking for was over $150,000. Now, that's the cap for REAP. He used to be. Now it's $250,000. So I called him up and said, hey, well, why don't we, you know, with sponsorship, there is no cap. So, you know, you can, you can get up to, you know, the full value of your project. In this case, he was eligible for about $200,000. The sponsor was eligible for about $200,000 of credit. So, he worked, he had a project loan with PPT. I don't know what PPT is called now. It used to be called PPT. Um, they're more like a central computer thing. But uh, he called them up and was able to work this sponsorship out. We switched the project from the farmer to PPT. The cap, you know, his REAP tax credit cap disappeared, so he got more funding based on that project. It locked it, you know, big, you know, $300,000 tax credits for that project. You know, he was left with this. this. This was his out of pocket cost after some NRCS money and others. He got a tax credit of $300,000. PBT, I don't know the full details, but they were paid about 90, about 90 cents on the dollar for that 300000 Locked it right off the principal that he needed for that project. So that was a great, I mean, a great uh, you know, relationship there and, and really sped up the process for that farmer of paying a big project back. Um, I haven't talked to the guy for a couple of years, but I hope, <laughs> I hope he's, he's moving along. Uh, anyway, keep, keep going. Yeah. All right, so I, I mentioned about um, loans. AgriLink program, I don't know, have you talked much about AgriLink out here? AgriLink, it's, it's suddenly more important than it ever was. It was, cre again, created a while ago, uh, where the, the Pennsylvania Treasury uh, guarantees loans to farmers for, for a whole slew of eligible practices. So, Again, going back to that project model that you get for, for doing so. Um, you know, for the longest time we've been living here with, with very low interest rates, but now suddenly, you know, lock, taking three percent off of an interest rate now is suddenly uh, very useful to, to anybody. Uh, so.
So Agnew Link is, is a way you work with your you know you work with your bank. There is and to clarify, there is a list of, of banks that have gone through the process of getting registered to be able to use this. It's almost every bank in the the, the the big kicker is is it's not you know farm well no I'm sorry Agnew Link farm credit and those folks can use Agnew. but you go through your own bank and, and they're the ones that can apply for this three percent. Rate. So that you're still working with your local bank the way you normally would. The uh, bank then can reduce your interest rate because the PA Treasury is guaranteed that. So that's uh, very useful um, if you're starting the process here of looking to fund your targets. Call me. We'll talk some more about this. Uh, talk to your lender too about that. Um, okay, next one. Hey, um, Maybe a private purpose. This is fairly new, big chunk of money. Just for this region, I just picked 10, 10 counties around here. It's about, yeah, $24 million. You know, I don't know which work lines out here, but I didn't get a whole lot here. But it's a lot of funding that needs to be spent very quickly on projects that, that are eligible for REIT, that are eligible for REIT, but all these other ones. So it's a great opportunity to, to use that to get something done fast. Uh, I, you know, I'm, Eric Kermer is the guy to call for that program. And there's other folks out here too. Uh, you know, Laurel, uh, Laurel Rush out here can, can help you all with that. But again, just to keep that on your radar, it's a great, if, if you're not ranking high enough with EQIP, but you're ready to go, you want to do something, ACAP's a great option for you. Whatever you do with ACAP is eligible for root tax credits too. Uh, and, and in some cases, I've had folks apply for REAP. Uh, you know, maybe last year or two years ago, and they're still not able to make that project work and get started on it. Shift to ACAP and get, you know, get that, that guaranteed funding, that check in the mail, so to speak. Get, get farmers over that last bump, that last spur to fund, fund big projects. Uh, so I just want to put that blurb in here. You know, you guys will know, you know, we have more of the details for the county than I'll be able to go over But here's, here's my contact. Uh, you know, right now for REAP, and it has been since 2013, anything in REAP comes to my desk. You know, whether it's you mail something or call me or email me. Uh, so at least you have a face to get mad at or whatever. You know, I'll, I'll try to get back to as many people as I can uh, in any given day, but sometimes it takes me a place to get it. To get it. But uh, just, I just put that out there just so you know. If you send in an application, it's not going to some big black void in space. It's going to end up on my desk. You can always call me. You can always email me uh, if you have specific questions. I think I mentioned that about everybody. Specific <laughs> questions. Everybody's project is different. I understand that. Uh, I'm always trying to work with farmers as best I can. Please call me. Don't be afraid to call me. Just because you missed something or are not sure about something on the application, I'm not going to reject applications. I'll just call you. We'll figure it out. Uh, so with that, I just want to yeah, take, take lots of questions.
how, how do you guys do it? Do farmers approach you about certifying practices? Kind of so most, mostly we use a NRCS. Yeah. Yeah, it varies county to county. Sometimes NRCS doesn't want to certify practices that they can fund. Sometimes they do. Some counties will do that for farmers. I don't know what you see here. But you can always hire a professional engineer to do that. I'm sorry, it's a little bit tangential to what you actually asked. But That's okay. The, my point saying is that, yeah, you can pick and choose. Um, you know, I've had, again, I've had plenty of farmers apply for me just to know that they have stuff reserved for them. And then, go through that waiting process with NRCS and decide to go with NRCS. From, from an administrative standpoint, I just say, keep me in the loop on that because if you change your mind about where you want to get funded, and you tell me you're early enough, then I can send that funding to some other like farm right. that's ready and waiting for it. Uh, whether that's ACAP or, or Growing Greener or these other ones, they all have their pluses and minuses. You know, I've said it before, I, I sort of say REAP is kind of like your last backstop. You can just apply based on cost estimates to know that you have something waiting for you. And then you can go try to get this other thing. You know, REAP is 50% for a waste storage facility of your actual cost. But if you go with, like, say, NFCS, it's an incentive payment, so it kind of depends on it. But I found that usually that the check that you were direct deposit that you would get from NFCS would be slightly higher. But again, you can couple that. You can still use REAP for that remaining 50%. Uh, yeah, that asked, is your question sufficient? Yeah, that was good. Thank you. Okay. So the one question I think in a way you mentioned is what percent of tax credits do they get from projects over other funding sources? Yeah, it, it's the same. It's the same. It's 50% or 75% or, or up to 90% here in that portion. It's just that, you know, if we subtracted that NRCS funding, I keep saying NRCS funding, but again, yeah, you know, we're talking about a small chunk here, but it's still that 50%. It's still that 75%, depending on the practice. But the key there is to do all the other funding sources first before coming over here. Yep, yep, you got it. We just subtract that other funding first. So. But you can still apply for it while you're doing the other funding sources. Worst case scenario, you reserve too much tax credit, so that would be reality. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. It's it's um it's a little bit of a, an accounting game where I try to anticipate people doing that. But again, I just ask you if you if you haven't figured it out early enough, call me and tell me so I can reallocate stuff to other farmers just to try to be as nice and nice as I can and have a dollar as far as we can. Uh, but the same goes for sponsorship. I mean you could apply on your own uh, just to make sure you get in and then go find a sponsor. You know, if you, if you don't know anybody right off the top of your head, put an application in for that full mail, and then, and then, you know, if you get NRCS funding, great, we'll reduce your credits a little bit, or we'll, if you find a sponsor, we'll shift it to, to that. So that's um, sort of like timing of things. You can submit an application right on, you know, August, this is the first Monday of August this year, I think it's the fifth or sixth or something like that. You can submit an application on August 6th for the full mail your whole project, and then work through the process with ACAP, work through the process with NCS, and go find sheets to be sponsored or something like that. That's what I advise the farmers because it goes fast. It's first come, first serve. It, it, by October, we'll be out of money on first serve this year again. Can you provide a couple of smaller uh, scale examples where we benefited the farmers? Yeah, good question. I'm sorry. I meant to get in that with cover crops. Cover crops is a big one. Um, you know, it's 50% of the cost that you, and that includes, you know, seed costs, obviously, uh, planting costs, if you're custom planting, if something you're hiring, custom planting, you're have those two bills, that's easy. If it's your own seed, if it's been around wheat, make me a bill for that. We cap that out at 12 bucks a bushel, but, you know, make me a, make me a bill for your seed that's in your bin. Uh, if you're the one planting it, make me a bill for your per acre cost of planting. Again, we have a cap, 25 bucks an acre if you're drilling it, uh, 18 bucks an acre if you're broadcasting it, but uh, make me a bill for your time. That's, so that's a small pot if you're doing, you know, I, the smallest tax credit we get is, again, it, it could be any amount, but usually, I think
think this past year, the smallest one I saw was about 350 bucks of credit. It was for a $500 IDS plan, you know, $350 to the front and back in front of the tax credit. Average cost for, you know, average amount of credit is usually about thirty-five dollars to 40000 But again, I get plenty of, you know, 10-foot drill, you know, or use 10-foot drill, send me a bill, you know, uh, a smaller, you know, $7,000 tax credit. Cover crops, again, that's a small one. Um, grass waterways, too, especially if you're, you know, if you're working on a grass waterway and you're getting other funding. You know, then the pot to, to reap, or the section to reap is a small one, you might get a, you know, a couple thousand dollars of that. But it, it, it just varies on your bills. Unlike other programs, we, you know, I need to see bills. Uh, that's going to determine the size of, of, your, of your tax credit. But plenty of farmers, small things under you know, $100,000, I see it all the time. There's really, really no lower limit. Uh, yeah. So there's really no minimum Right, there's no minimum. Right, no minimum. The maximum is $250,000 in a seven year period. You, you know, you could go buy a Harvest International planter and blow it in one year if you want to. But, but well, a little more detail on that. But, you know, whether that takes you seven years to fill up or, or one application in one shot, it's $250,000 is the cap. So, but there's no way. Is there a special definition to cover crop? So, can the farmer decide, like, this year I'm taking off for forage? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so, so our standards for cover crops, uh, we, we erred on the side of making this as simple as possible and you getting it in the ground, that's what we do. I don't have any, any planting dates as of back south. This past year, you could be planting in you know, Thanksgiving and you still would have seen good growth. Uh, yes, forage is, you know, if you decide to cut up the forage, that is eligible. The only time it is not is if you're going to harvest it for seed, which I know that's hard to plan for all the time. But if you plant wheat and you're harvesting it for seed, that's not a that's not what we consider a cover crop. Um, you know, I mentioned about multi-species versus single species. You know, your forage. I guess it would be rare that you're getting two broadleaves in that mix of forage, but you could. I mean, if you had a Sure, okay, I don't need two clovers in there. I, you know, but I feel like that'd be rare, but it might happen. What do you call multi-species? Yeah, multi-species. So for us, multi-species is a is a, a um, well, it could be more, but a single species. I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, tongues get twisted. A a uh, small grain or grass species, like a wheat, rye, what have you, uh, mixed with at least two broadleaves. So that's usually a clover or a pea or something like that. And, and then further, that, that grass species that has to max out, you can't put more than a bushel and a half in there. We don't want those, that grass just covering, you know, being so thick that clover gets, gets smothered out. And then also there has to be at least five pounds, uh, five pounds of the acre of those raw leaves. Those specifications are they on that website? Yeah, sorry, that's yeah, that I made that sound a lot more complicated than it really is. But uh, yeah, the REAP guidelines package, which right now the REAP guidelines for 2022 is available on the website. Uh, come here in, in a in hopefully about three weeks, I'll get the new new one out to you. It'll have that spe those specifications exactly in there. It'll say you know one grass species or, or two, but your grass species plus at least two broad and then I'll have this, this planting in this system. Um, yeah. Can you sign up for cover crops every year? Yep, you can do three years at a time, actually. Uh, so send in, send in an application this, let's say you send in an application here in August. It can be for what you think you're gonna do for the fall of 23, fall of 24, or fall of 25. Then you just need to remember to send me receipts. You know, come uh, to Thanksgiving and make yourself know that you're sending receipts. Then you don't need to reapply every single year. You get at least three years of shot. Um, keep beating up this cover crop thing. Um, single species, you can do for how long before you have to go to all? Three years. Yeah. It's the same thing. You have one, one application for three years of that wheat or rye or whatever you do. Then, yeah. then if you want to 
reapply, and then it's got to be added to some stuff. Now, is that on all acres, or how is that? Divided? No, I mean what, whatever you do. Like if you would send, if you if you're doing, let's say, let's say for the next three years, you're going to do 500 acres of rye. Right. Uh, then, then after that, you send it in and you say, well, I can afford to maybe do 200 acres where I mix in clovers. Send, send me an application for those 200 acres. Okay. And you'd be eligible for those 200 acres. Yeah. But not the other? Yeah, the other, at that point, the single species would be out. Okay. Yeah. Now, do you have a list of engineers who you worked with before they could do your like, heavy use areas of concentration? Yeah, good question. That's become more of an issue. As there's more projects going on, certainly the demand for those engineers is, is certainly high. And I'm sure you found that found that to be the case too. Um, no, short answer is no. I, I certainly know who is commonly used uh, for ag projects. But again, the, the biggest thing to remember is anybody that has a professional engineer stand can can do it for you. Whether they never work with farmers ever before in their life. As long as they have a PE stamp and can read about the NRCS spectrum standards or our spectrum standards, they can verify that your, your product is built to that standard. I don't, I don't mean that for cover crops and fence and no. little type of projects like that. It's bigger projects that I need engineer certification for. But that's the key there is it still has to be NRCS specs. NRCS spectrum standards, but I, you know, that's a great point of uh, clarification. I mean, the biggest part of confusion there is that. When we say NRCS packing standards, that, that means it has to have exactly the amount of nails and those cross members. And NRCS packing standards are, are pretty vague. They want you, they want you controlling the pollution runoff. They want to make sure that it lasts for 10 years or whatever. And they might have a couple small specs on, you know, call for 4,000 psi or some other small details inside. That. That's different than needing an NRCS design or NRCS funding. I just need an engineer to say that yes, it's going to last that long. It's got pollution control and concerns taken care of. It's a little bit different than the mindset of I need an NRCS design for this building. You don't. If that design meets those spectrum standards for NRCS, again, that's a it sounds like a fine line, but if you read those spectrum standards, they're pretty vague. They're mostly dealing with dealing with the resources. So just for example, the, I built the dry lumber storage facility last year. Yeah. Um, personal funded. You know, yeah. I didn't have any, any engineering or anything funded. It. it would probably pass yeah. engineering. Uh, so can you go backwards on that? Like if I want to apply for that? Yeah, you actually have three years to come in for that. So, okay. so that's like the equipment. You still have three years to do it. Yeah, same with equipment. Any practice right now now is that is that simple three years. You have it from the from the date of completion or the date when that plant was delivered to your farm. You have three years to apply for for the So yeah. So yeah. Anybody listen? I mean, just cover crops. Here? No, no, good question. Cover crops. <laughs> I can't go back past the fiscal year, which we were on state fiscal school year, so that's July first. When you apply for something on, on August 5th for cover crops, it's it's moving forward. I can't go back in time for cover crops because they're they're gone at that point. Right? There's no there's no. I mean, it's hard enough for me to get out and see projects. There's no way I could see a cover crop from the PA legislature to try to put about that. So, well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know I I I because you got some receipts. I don't know why you would have a receipt for X amount of. Over uh, but I, uh, I can't go back in time for crop crops. Anything else? Yeah, yeah we have an online question. Okay. So we apply for same resources that may be needed in a roof heavy use area building such as gates, waters, etc. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I get that question a lot with, with the stuff inside the building. Uh, certainly, roof heavy use area, that's a practice, common practice for green, whether that's a, you know, a shelter for green things that you're running into. Some improvement for whatever animals you have. Uh, the gates and things like that, the way I work that, yes, they are eligible. Every once in a while, I run into a scenario where somebody has bought like 40 gates for inside a building. I'll, I'll pair that back. I'll, I'll cut that and make it a little bit. Because that starts to get pretty expensive. But 
no gates, waterers, electric, all that, everything that goes into that building um, is, is eligible. I have just one thing to clarify that if you dig a well to put water in the building, the well is not eligible. But everything else is, until you get to a point where I notice it and the costs are really excessive. Yeah. Does that answer that question sufficiently? Yeah, anyone online, thank you for using the chat. Also, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask any questions. Is there really anything that's not covered, like, so to speak, that, like, it seems like it's kind of broad based if you're going from waters from inside to outside, up across? Yeah, um, I mean, the biggest thing to keep in mind for Reap, and I should, again, I should have mentioned this up front, I mean, Reap is, is tasked with, it's a water quality product. EMP per. So we're talking about anything that reduces nitrogen, phosphorus, or something. Those three things. Uh, we don't, NRCS provides funding for some things that we don't, you know, like pollinator habitat and that kind of stuff. Those are great. It's just that group is focused on nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. Every once in a while, we'll, we'll, we have some practices for like aerial deposition of nitrogen, but most of what we're talking about is fertilizer and Manure runoff, animal concentration areas, you know, cover crops that soak that stuff out of the water, that stuff we get into the water. No skill farming practices. That's kind of thing. So, uh, in, in our guidelines, there's a, a list of, of almost everything I always see. But every once in a while, someone will have a, an idea, something that they're putting in that I don't have on my list. Again, call me. I mean, it's it's listed in our guidelines. Other. If you, have, if you have something that you're doing that, that you don't see on the list, give me a call. But the stuff in our guidelines, the list of it, that's, that's like 99% of what I see. So the best bet is to go on your website, check your guidelines, make sure it's even something worth applying for. Yeah, yeah the, way, the way the application is set up now, you don't see it in the application. The application just says blank spots where you write in what you're doing. The guidelines is where you see that long list of practices. A long list of like what the specifications are referring to cover crops so, or what those details that we have. That's in the guidelines. I try to keep those applications as small as possible, but <laughs> it's hard when you've got that long list of practices. Yeah. Well, on, a, on a grain drills and that, people are putting scales on there. Is that part of precision or? <sighs> yeah. Oh man, that, that's a tough one. On, on drills, you're saying? Yeah, or? grain drills. Just when the scales, because the test weight of all the seeds is different. Uh, again, see, you, you mentioned there about for seeds. Anything for seeds that you're adding on after the fact, uh, it wouldn't be. So, you know, plates, precision capabilities that are just for seeds, no. If you go buy that drill and it has the scales on it, it's, um, it's going to be included in the purchase price. Do it prior to the sale. I'm not going to cut it out. But if you would go and add scales to it, that's not. Okay. But if you add some nutrient uh, placement capabilities to your plant, that would be it. Any Does it matter if it's equipment over other BMPs? It's just first, first come, first serve. Yeah, it's first come, first serve. Um, Get, that sort of hits back onto the ACA stuff. If it's a pro, if you're applying for, or if you have animal control issues or animal concentration area issues, I can reserve credits for your equipment, but I can't award it until your until your bigger project is done. That's sort of related to what you're asking there. But but um, to your broader point there, first come first serve. We don't do any rankings of projects. So in a given year, I'd say about 50 to 60 percent goes to equipment. Late, lately, it's been more equipment heavy just because there are so many other pots of funding available for the mineral storage or BP that I still have lots of projects, but the amount of credits needed for those projects is effectively less because there are new lots of access funding, they cap funding, and things like that. So, yeah, this year, this past year, I think it was almost 60% of our funding went toward some sort of equipment. And, and that's just to clarify for everybody, I know you weren't really asking, but that's no-till planters, no-till drills. 
uh, precision components, um, precision nutrient components, uh, cover crop rollers, um, that's, that's the equipment that's We used to have production. The guidance systems and stuff? Like yeah, yeah, stuff in your cab, plus stuff on the sprayer, planter, what have you. Application, you said you should list basically everything that you're trying to think, which would be like, call you first and say like, hey, this is our one big project we want to put on, like this is our priority, or should we try to list? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that it matters too much, unless you're talking about timing. If you've got projects that are spanning, you know, three or four years, then, then yeah, give me a call about that stuff. What I've found usually is that stuff gets done, you know, Prioritization of it is not so important. I think with the equip program, you have to have certain stuff done in a certain amount of time. And this not yeah, it's more it's, like free. Right, it's not like that. So if you've got an equip project that has, yeah, you know, 20 PMPs listed like they do, like NRCS does, they break it into 20 line items. First off, I don't need to redundant copy that and write it into a rebound. I understand how the system works. If you just send me those, whatever NRCS sends you, or just kind of summarize it and say, you know, this is, hey, this is a waste storage and volume of project. That's sufficient. Now, back to your question. Yeah, we can, we can award credits as things get done, so long as the first thing that gets done is ACA related stuff. That's kind of a kicker. I mean, technically, we can do step by step by step, but that heavy use area protection is hanging out there undone. Now, I'll back up and say I am very willing to work with farmers who are contracted to do all that stuff or are with ACAP to do all that stuff. I'm very willing to release credits in a piecemeal fashion over time if, if they're involved with those other programs and we have some, some sort of confidence that that, that, that animal project is going to be done. That's how I I know that's, that's a lot of information I split at you. I'm still like flying the emails out here from the turn right. Um, call, call me anytime. And again, the biggest thing here is to get me, if you're interested in applying for this year, give me your name and, and either email or mailing address as soon as you can. Uh, maybe Jeff or, or Rich can send me a list of guys. Uh, that way I can send you the application as soon as it's available here in three weeks or so. That way you're not fishing around trying to find it. Uh, you can get started with these guys to use certifications and verifications that you might need ahead of time. So that come August, you're ready to uh, get, we'll get you on the list for this year. But, you know, uh, thus far, you know, we've been around since 2007. Uh, the legislature has been very good to us, but we seem like we're, we're happy with what we're doing here. So, you know, I feel good moving forward that uh, we'll continue to get our funding. But, you know, we, it goes year to year to year. Yeah, with that, I mean, there's my contact info. I didn't bring much of anything with me to hand out to you. <laughs> so give me a call, email me, talk to these guys, they'll pass, their, pass it all to me. Uh, any other questions? All right, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.